there and welcome to another book vlog. I'm Tracy Harding and today I'm going to be talking to you about the first book of my second trilogy which is the fourth book in the Ancient Future series and that is Chronicle of Ages. Now this was not the fourth book I wrote. There was a couple of standalones in between but um, more books were needed for the Ancient Future series, um, although, well, that's what my fans told me anyway. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later in this vlog. But this book, Chronicle of Ages, was uh, published in the year 2000. It's only ever had one jacket and one edition, and it's still out there to be had. Um, and it continues the story of the Chosen Ones, uh, three different stories or periods of time that were not covered in the first trilogy. So this book is set when the Chosen have actually settled on uh, another planet and Noah Purcell, who is one of the Chosen, is the head of the Institute of Immortal History where he has put together um, all the Chronicle of Ages which are basically thought recordings um, documenting the past lives and experiences of all the chosen and one day uh, a couple of his students come to him to complain that there's quite a few um, very key periods missing from his chronicles and Noah sets about going to collect these missing periods. But what he doesn't realize is that those periods have been skipped because either himself or one of the other chosen have been blocking them out for personal reasons, reasons that, they, that they're going to have to face to, to chronicle these particular eras. Um, so the first one takes place in ancient Gwyneth when uh, Melgren is uh, rising to High King of Britain. Um, the second one covers Melgren's uh, period of time in space with the Lord Mark Duke that um, what was going on while Tory and some of the other chosen were down here preparing for the gathering of kings on this planet. And then the last one takes place back in ancient Gwyneth again during Rune's rise to High King and the battle for that position um, in ancient Britain. Um, this is actually one of my personal favorite books and I'll tell you why a little bit later on but um, that's basically it about uh, the premise behind this story. Any more? If you want to know any more, you're going to have to read it. So where did the concept for Chronicle of Ages come from? Well, it came from me getting a whole stack of fan mail um, saying, what do you mean you finished this story? You haven't finished these stories. There's all these periods missing. So basically, um, I put Noah in my shoes when I wrote the first scenes of this book with his students coming to him going, look, this period's missing, this period's missing, we want to know about this bit. That was actually my readers coming to me going, but what about when Melwin became High King and what did he do during his time in space and was Rune ever High King and blah, blah, blah. So um, that's really where the concept of this book came from and it is why it's one of my personal favourites because this whole trilogy came about because my readers really pushed for it. So what books had a bearing on this book? I, well, a lot. Um, a lot of the books that I've shown you before I also referenced again. But this time we had the... Um, the Roman priests or the Roman faith kind of intruding on the story for the first time really with with um, uh, 
Conan coming into the story. And um, the book I used to research that was The Conversion of Europe. This was quite an interesting book, pretty heavy subject matter though. But if you're ever looking for the whole conversion of um, – and the UK was included in Europe here um, – that's a good book to look at. Um, also, just for general, if you're writing about the uh, the Celts, I leaned on this book fairly heavily, the Dictionary of Celtic Mythology, which has basically got um, anything you would want to know about that period, uh, the Dark Ages. Uh, this one I've mentioned to you before is the Encyclopedic Psychic Dictionary, which I just basically just take it for granted that I use this book on just about every book I've ever written and I'm still using it as you can see because there's a question coming up a little bit later about um, soul mates and twin souls and I actually reference this book just to get its take on it um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, this book, oh my god, just beautiful. Um, the Encyclopedia of Arthurian Legends, and I mean, really, it is just every single page is just completely gorgeous. So, I mean, really, uh, besides the information, that book is just a beautiful uh, book to just sit there and look at. It's it's absolutely gorgeous. Just transforms you. Um, this book, if you're ever travelling Britain and you want to go and see all the sacred sites. This book is fantastic. It's got all the sites in here. Um, it's got them all mapped out on a map where you can find them, um, pictures of them, obviously. Um, but yeah, and it's got it all broken down into different states. Uh, you can see, oops, where's the, like here, see? And it's got like all the little marks on the map and then you can go reference where the sites are and that's it covers the whole of the UK basically so the Atlas of Magical Britain I'd absolutely definitely recommend that especially if you're traveling there to do a quick footnote on the soundtrack although I used all that music um, writing this book um, the Pink Floyd album Division Bell was was very very useful when I wrote the third story the ages darkest tale um, cluster one the first track on the album is a very spacey one. It was just like I could just see Rune in space on the deck of that spaceship just thinking about having to put this story together because it was one of the most horrendous in his memory. Um, and the other two songs that were particularly relevant to that part of the story were High Hopes and Poles Apart, if you want to look them up. Both fantastic songs, such a fantastic album really. I mean the whole thing was very um, inspiring for me for that part of the story. So there you go. So I'm combining the underlying themes of this book along with a reader question that I had this week. And the question was, um, at some point, um, could you go into some information on twin souls? Um, there was a lot of romanticism of soulmates as a true love, but uh, people are coming to a different understanding of what a soulmate is now. But now people are using the term twin flame and romanticizing it to the same point of it being um, destructive 
when in all likelihood people are not with their twin flame to begin with. Um, and so Chantel wanted me to kind of go into um, an explanation of all of that. And um, so let's just have a deeper look at that, shall we? So let's talk about soulmates first. According to the Donning International Dictionary, soulmates are two souls that have split from one monad to experience life. And quite often they won't ever meet because that will kind of defeat the purpose because they've split in half to be able to cover more ground. But then there's another definition of soulmates that is they are someone who you can feel yourself with, that you feel an affinity with, uh, but they're not necessarily there to be or romantic and be your perfect partner. They're more there to reflect or mirror you and so that you can dig deep and find what it is that's holding you back. They're there to challenge you. And there's not necessarily just one soulmate for everyone in every life because you come from a group soul and there's going to be other soul minds within that group that you're going to meet and have an affinity with. Then you have twin flames and twin flames is more about, uh, you know, the man, female, other half to each other, which is kind of what I was getting at with, uh, the chosen ones. Uh, it was Plato that actually first put forward the whole split apart theory, which is really where twin flames came from. And it was about the gods splitting uh, these creatures that were originally just one androgynous being into male and female, so that basically they spent more time trying to find each other than they did trying to bring down the gods. Um, so that theory then developed into this idea of twin flames and this having the perfect other half. In The Immortal Bind I spoke about the split apart story and in that tale you had two lovers constantly being drawn together over several different lifetimes. But really, ultimately, it was about them realizing their own shortcomings so that they could release their karma, which is what I was saying about uh, soulmates being challenging and making you see uh, what it is that you're needing to overcome. Because in the Taoist religion and in Buddhism, detachment is the key to enlightenment not seeking a soulmate so that really is the ultimate goal and when you are seeking love elsewhere that's really just keeping you bound up here in the earth plane it's about releasing everything rather than looking for a soulmate mate or looking for a, a twin flame you need to realize that you are complete within yourself you don't need completing there's other versions of you out there that you don't necessarily have to meet to feel complete there are other people that you will feel an affinity with that will teach you lessons I mean ultimately we are all one so there's no perfect other we're born alone we will die alone and uh, really we're here to experience and just be not to search for somebody else or depend on somebody else or count on somebody else to make us feel happy and fulfilled so we had a, a late addition question wise from one of my readers and it was from Gavin who has always has a fantastic question for me with every one of these blogs and the question this time was uh, or it was more a statement really that I must have had some foresight about where uh, the next couple of books were going um, when I wrote Chronicle of Ages because um, when Melgren had his initiation with the Night Hunter um, they were looking into his future to see whether he would be worthy to be High King so um, 
The answer is yes. I did have some foresight about where it was going because he said, well, was it just mused or, you know, what came first, the chicken or the, or the egg? You know, did you know about that or did you just put down what you thought and later on it all sort of came together? And the answer is probably a little bit of both. And it kind of ties in with a writing question I had from um, one of my readers as well who was writing something and said, how do you, um, you know, plot for what's going on ahead? And I said, well, you do... You do have to be a little bit psychic. You have to glimpse ahead without trying to control what's going to happen. And I think that's basically what I did in this instance. And yes, all those instances came to pass. And I can't remember if I actually, you know, saw those instances at the time I was doing this scene with no idea really where they were going. But I think more likely I actually had a vague outline of where the next two books were going to go and I just picked uh, particular instances from them that were relevant to the initiation. I hope that answers the question. Thanks Gavin. Back in my study at the Institute, the thought recorder Tori had returned to me sat idle on my desk. The orb seemed to be taunting me as I pondered what could have driven Selwyn into isolation. Years ago, back on Gaia, I was contacted by the part of my higher self that was once Selwyn. The great druid told me he had left all of his precious histories in the safekeeping of Taliesin, high druid of Britain, to give to me Selwyn's chosen incarnation. Not one of the documents had mentioned Selwyn's time spent in isolation, nor what had driven him to it, and where other periods of Maelgwyn's reign were heavily documented, his rise to high king status was not even given a mention. Whatever it was that happened during this time, Selwyn sure didn't want it remembered, perhaps by me least of all. So... I reached out and took the thought recorder in hand. I have been blocking out these recollections since the Dark Ages, eh? I sat back in my seat and made myself comfortable. Sorry, Selwyn, it has to be done. I activated the play function and opened my mind to its data. The recording commenced with an oratory from Tory that overlaid a visual of a memory of presiding over a general meeting of the Allied Kingdoms of Britain. The rise of Maelgwyn to the status of High King of Britain began during the tenth year of his reign as King of Gwynedd, 529 AD, Gaia time. Aurelius Conan, son of Aurelius Caninus, King of Gwent Ishkoid, returned from studying in Italy the same year to assume the crown of Gwent Ishkoid. That year, the Beltane Festival was hosted at Castle Dwyran in Dyfed. All the leaders from the surrounding kingdoms descended upon Vortipor, the protector of Dyfed, and his lovely wife, the Lady Kara, to partake of their hospitality for the duration of the festival that would continue for several days. So... Thank you so much to Belinda Audio for letting me uh, use an audio grab so that you can have a bit of a sneak peek at what the audio book might be like. For this second trilogy, we've got guys narrating rather than Edwina Wen because I couldn't get Edwina for this series. And um, Grant had a good stab at Chronicle of Ages and although he may not be as um, excellent at um, the Welsh pronunciations as Edwina, I think he gave it a, a good shot and um, he uh, his voice is very pleasant to listen to. And um, the next two in the series are narrated by Benedict Hardy. 
um, who did a fantastic job on those books as well. So we'll have those coming up in coming months. Um, that's all for this video blog. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, next month we'll be doing uh, Tablet of Destinies. So do join in for that. I've got lots more videos coming up on the channel over the month. It's just that I only do one of these book blogs a month because they're quite time consuming. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, please like, share and subscribe. That's really helpful to me. Um, all the links to everything of mine, my books and mentor sessions and Patreon and everything, all below. And um, I hope I see you again soon. Thanks so much for watching. Bye for now.